Okay, I thought I'd make a few comments on teacher resources. Um, I had a little sort of discussion with a couple of teachers in the last couple of days. I've noticed on Twitter that suddenly, or people will dispute this, but suddenly people have started to put up um, video resources. And uh, groups like uh, the Cog Science and Team English have begun to sort of coalesce as uh, grassroots resource building um, communities. Now I find this quite interesting because going right back to 1994 uh, I started to produce resources for the internet before even really just as the World Wide Web was beginning. Um, I was on the internet before the World Wide Web and one of the first things as a primary teacher I noticed was that uh, there were no resources for the British Museum. And my school, the school I worked in, um, was doing ancient Greeks on the curriculum. And people talk about there being no, uh, so talk about knowledge and organisers and things like that nowadays. Well, the first thing I wanted to do was go to the British Museum. And I took a camera, I took a, an SLR, and I photographed loads and loads and loads of the ancient Greek resources. I did ask uh, the museum permission, the museum's permission, and they kindly gave me the permission, because I remember even five, ten years back, there used to be um, Kodachrome slides of exhibits in the British Museum, and then there weren't any in the mid-90s. Now there's a whole plethora of wonderful resources on the web uh, by the museum itself, but in those days, nothing. So being the school closest to um, the British Museum and the fact that I took school parties there on a regular basis and I'd written lots and lots of worksheets to go with the exhibits in the cases because I always believed and still do that children shouldn't walk through a museum, shouldn't breeze through a museum. They need to have their attention focused specifically on the objects and get them to think around how those objects were used and in the context of that historical period as much as you can do. But it does give a sort of very graphic, um, concrete example for them. So I took a polarizer, which is a special lens, and I took loads and loads and loads of photographs of several of the museums in the ancient Greek trail. And I put those up online. I taught myself HTML. I sat down, I taught myself HTML. I put them up online, and within days I was getting a quarter of a million hits. But not from this country, because no one was online in this country at that particular time. Mostly from... Um, California and school children doing their um, school projects on the west coast of California um, and so therefore I realized that this was quite a big deal. Um, so in, the, in these times of knowledge organizers it was very interesting to see that even in those days just to let people know that someone like me who's quite um, maybe more on the progressive side of things um, would take uh, and atomize certain aspects of the curriculum, which we're all discussing now, um, get examples of that in museums and put them up. Subsequently, with my class, I think it was my year three, year four class, we went to the um, Science Museum and we um, did the same thing. We created a whole trail to do with the Science and Materials exhibition that was on at the time. And we actually put all that up and we won the first STEM um, competition for multimedia materials online. You would remember that this is in the mid 90s so it was sort of uh, um, a not very well known thing to do in those days. Um, I've always been an outlier in, the, in that respect. So I mean one of the things I used to do was take my planning week by week and in all the subject areas say what we were doing and put it into a PDF and put it online. Only about one or two parents could read that in those days, if anyone in the population. Um, you know, we were a run-of-the-mill London school with quite difficult kids in there as well. That would be sort of standard uh, now. People would be able to pull that down and read it. So, as I gained expertise in making multimedia, um, I was then commissioned by the Science Museum to be a museum online um, 
sort of writer for a web page. So again, I went deeper into HTML and I taught myself Flash and uh, created interactives and also created a lot of, uh, I created a whole site on the history of astronomy to do with the Apollo 10 uh, capsule that they have at the museum. And that was put up on the Franklin Museum site and the Science Museum site. And the deeper I went into it, the more expertise I got. And this is on top of a full-time teaching load. So I was doing 80, 90, 100 hours a week, um, not sleeping um, half the time. And that led to me writing a book and that led to me um, having to leave teaching in the end because my expertise became so great that I was given the choice by my head teacher. Either I'd stop going out and consulting on things or working for firms, uh, or I'd leap sideways and take a, a job, and I eventually did, in um, a big film company, which uh, where I then learnt all about live streaming and film. And part of my job was to take Shakespearean texts and create um, resources for them or blue sky them. And what I was doing in those days was looking at CDs and whether you could link text in the CD to the precise bit in the Shakespearean play. So you could jump from one specific bit in that Shakespearean play in the film directly to the text and vice versa. And we also did a whole um, classical music site and resource which allowed someone to build their own classical music resources according to the um, QCA curriculum in those days. Now, the point is, uh, fast forward 20 years, 22 years, yeah? And people ask, beginning because of the wonder of YouTube and online resources like that, um, beginning to put up little YouTube films. Now, part of what I wanted to say to the teachers was, if you actually use the technology precisely enough, you can get that granularity of detail that you want to have for when you're teaching. And also, you'll be able to build a bigger, cohesive resource. But here's the rub. These teachers who, who are now finding it easier, because the technology has got so easy, let's face it, you can stick up um, uh, a film just by putting a camera on a tripod, turning it on, filming someone. It's not as easy as that, but more or less is. Push it right up to, uh, to YouTube. But when you ask people, when you ask teachers to go that little bit further, uh, like point out that you can actually take the um, transcript, which uh, the Google is now very good at, the AI, and pull that down. It'll only take you about 10 minutes to edit it. Then you could put that up as a text resource as well. Um, also, you can uh, timestamp various specific bits within the film. So if you wanted to reference these uh, resources in a bundle, you could. But of course, the teachers then say, um, well, we can't do that. We can't... Um, it's, it's, it's taking away from our commitment to our communities and to our workload. And that's fair enough. I understand that. I had that back in the day myself. I was doing a 9200 hour week. And of course, what inevitably happens is the people who do do that inevitably build up enough expertise to jump out of teaching because they do go the extra mile. Um, you know, I find a lot of people who say this also, you know, work their way up to writing a book um, which, you know, it's the same thing and it's probably more labour intensive. But my, my, my gripe really is that either the College of Teaching or the DfE should be paying for a group of teachers to be able to do this. Um, not everyone's going to be like me, a total nutter who will go out and learn all this and learn all the knowledge to actually transmit the knowledge. Um, that's quite interesting. Um, looking at various um, theories coming up now about dual code coding, I noticed that, that I was up to that back in the mid-90s. Um, I know the theory behind all that, and it's interesting to see how that's evolving and coming to the fore now, how you use multimedia resources. So my point is this. Um, when we had the curriculum online, uh, they asked all the consultants... Uh, what they should put in the curriculum and how they should build the resources and things. Well, that's not how things evolve in terms of teaching communities. 
what they learned very quickly is that that was a failure. Um, people didn't want to actually have curriculum online and then pull it down. What happened was, in terms of folksonomies, this is where people, it emerges from grassroots in what people want. And if you make it easy enough for people to build the resources from their own communities, and I've said this for over 20 years because you know, of my history, then you are able to build a substantial, robust um, resource that will stand the test of time. Um, the problem is workload and free time. And really, this is something the College of Teaching or the DFE or other professional organisations need to think about, to be able to enable people to do that. And I would suggest a sabbatical for someone who is um, fairly technical savvy and who has the knowledge in specialist fields in specific subject areas or in the primary area. Someone been giving a sabbatical of six months to a year to be able to work with teachers and build this resource and then to put it out there for free. Uh, that seems to me like the real curriculum online that should have been happening 10, 20 years ago. And we are at the point now where the ability to be able to film and transmit that knowledge and do it in a way that's really clever. And I, I feel still that people need to work on how they do that in terms of putting out uh, information. There are specific ways that you could make it uh, more easily digestible. Um, could be done. And I don't know why anyone isn't sort of pushing this. And, and in, in, in that sense, this is what I wanted to, to push on the agenda, is that, yes, if people haven't got the time, they've got the time to create the initial resource, and they've got the time to sort of link it up in an ad hoc way on, on Twitter or use their subject associations. But in my, in my uh, limited uh, a sort of opinion, that uh, <laughs> subject associations tend to be too bureaucratic, uh, where you've got this free-range Twitter uh, dynamic dynamicism or whatever what, whatever the word is happening and it is just still happening because they did ask for examples of this and I still see very very few examples coming from the community because very few people actually are makers when it comes to resources in terms of uh, putting them out there for a wider audience uh, let's say um, so really at this point what would be most useful for the teaching community I think would be paid sabbaticals for someone to liaise with these associations and I don't want to do it um, but I think it should come from the teaching force and get people to use this expertise so if you want knowledge organizers if you want to flesh them out with specific videos or specific animations or specific um, multimedia I'm not talking about PowerPoint I'm talking about specific highly focused um, pieces of uh, information uh, around that knowledge, which you can then tie together in a cohesive manner so that you have it indexed and filed so that someone searching for it can actually go off and find a specific resource either for them, for their CPD as a professional, or for their, for their uh, students. So that's what I wanted to say, really. We're, we're still, even after, I think, 20 years, only on the lip of being able to use uh, new technologies and media in very highly specific, rigorous, if you want, ways. And uh, I think there should be no excuses for not pushing forward with that. But at the same time, I think government and subject associations and something like the uh, college should be able to offer that kind of um, arena for people to create. And that's all I'm going to say on the subject.